haves and the have-nots. These are totals, rainfall totals over the past 45 days for six weeks. Again, look at these numbers across northern Missouri, generally north of Highway 36. Six to nine to 10 inches over 12 inches of rain. It's just uh, amazing the disparity you get as you head south where things dry out quickly across central Missouri and southern parts of the state. I mean, we have some totals right down here in Howell County and um, Oregon and Ripley County. They've had less than an inch over the past six weeks. And anything under two inches, you're going to start seeing some drought impacts over this, over this long a period during the heart of summer. And indeed, we're seeing lots of drought impacts. And I'd say it's justified to compare this to perhaps what we saw a decade ago in 2012. It's not as bad as it was in 2012. That extended through the end of August. Nonetheless, we're really starting to see the impacts ramp up. And especially in combination with this intense heat, uh, it is somewhat similar to what we saw in July of 2012. Look at these numbers over the next uh, five days. Today, especially again, the southern half of the state. As I noted, it's been, they've had plenty of precip across northern Missouri, but when the precip doesn't fall and you have a notable evaporative loss, those soils are dry, the, veg the vegetation is stressed, and so it's retaining that moisture. You've pretty much created a, a desert-like environment, and so that sun just bakes the atmosphere and we're seeing that all across the southern half of the state over the next five days with triple digit heat forecast uh, for today and on through Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Look at Saturday highs uh, generally in the low to, to up to 104, 105 degrees across parts of the southern half of Missouri, upper 90s across northern Missouri. There is a cold front forecast to move into the state on Sunday and cool those temperatures down across northern Missouri, but still. Low 100s expected um, into Sunday across the southern half of the state. It's just not a good situation on top of the lack of water. Things are only going to continue to deteriorate before hopefully we see a pattern change next week with some better chances of precipitation. Obviously, with all the heat, uh, and um, we're going to see some high heat indices. There are heat advisors across the southern parts of the state where the dew point is a little bit higher and those temperatures are in the low 100s, that can create some dangerous conditions if you're outside for an extended period of time. So please be aware of the impact that the heat can have on your body, as well as uh, pets and, and um, livestock as we go through the next few days. And with these dry conditions, there's always the risk of fires. There are reports of some fires breaking out in Mark Twain National Forest, also some grass fires across parts of Southern Missouri. So please be aware of the potential of grass fires uh, vulnerability with this heat and dry conditions. The forecast over the next seven days uh, doesn't look terribly encouraging. Uh, at least they're indicating there is a chance perhaps of some precipitation starting late in the day on Sunday into early next week, perhaps impacting northern Missouri. Again, they've been getting the rainfall, so as much as a quarter to a half inch, lighter amounts, unfortunately, as you go south. I will try to be a little bit optimistic, uh, considering it's been rather dire and sobering looking at some of the impacts we're seeing across the southern half of Missouri. On the left, not terribly encouraging. It looks like these hot temperatures are gonna continue towards the end of July, but somewhat here on the right, this is what I wanna focus on. Uh, the forecasters, the models are indicating perhaps another cold front uh, slipping further south into Missouri that'll hang out, that'll become stationary, and perhaps bring us some day-to-day -day chances as we go into the middle and latter part of next week. So there is an enhanced likely likelihood of above average precipitation. We just haven't seen this type of forecast in several weeks, and so it's refreshing. I'm hoping it's one that verifies because we really need the rain uh, and these hot temperatures over the next few days are only going to exacerbate the situation. I do want to emphasize, hopefully we can report this information. We can provide impact information. We can submit pictures. We can provide um, dialogue or narrative on how bad it is in our state. I encourage folks to visit this website and to enter their condition monitoring observer report. Uh, this is seen at the local, state, and national level. This is a a website that's hosted by the National Drought Mitigation Center based in Lincoln, Nebraska. It provides information to decision makers, not only at the state level, but at the national level. And what better way 
to uh, indicate, you know, I can't think of a person who better knows a drought and its impact than a person who's living in that affected area. So I encourage folks to share this information, go to the website and report what you're experiencing in regard to the dryness and the impacts. And there's a QR code that you can use on the bottom right to submit your condition monitoring observer reports. These are the reports since the beginning of July. Uh, the, the colored map you see here is the drought monitor map. And then each of these dots are reports that have been submitted through this website. I encourage folks again uh, to report that information. We've had 103 reports as of this morning, and those numbers are, are only gonna go up as this drought continues. You can submit information, you can provide pictures. Again, a picture is worth a thousand words and it's very helpful when assessing drought at the county level. So please uh, check out this website. These are just some of the sobering pics that we're seeing that are being submitted through the Condition Monitoring and Observer Report System. Again, many Southern counties where we're seeing the burned up lawns and pastures, corn is being chopped for silage. Uh, it's just not a good situation. Ponds are starting to go dry and it is important and imperative that we provide the best information we can to decision makers at the state and national level. Eli, that's pretty much a, a, a weather report. I'll hand it back over to you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks, Pat. That's a sobering view on the weather. I was really surprised that corn in Lawrence County looked like it was pineapples. It's so rolled over. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over now to Debbie. She'll be our moderator for today's session. Yeah. Hi, I'm happy to be the moderator for today. And we're very happy that Eli has joined us as a team for horticulture across the state. Um, I'm going to work real closely with him because I'm in the same region that he's in, in the urban East region, and happy to have some additional help over here. So welcome, Eli, and thank you for, for thinking of Extension and joining us as part of our team. What I'd like to do is um, let you guys know that there were quite a few questions that came in uh, through the, the, the box that you guys go to every week um, if you wanted to post a question. So we're happy to answer those for you. The first one that came in is from an individual who has planted a black haw viburnum as well as an American cranberry bush. And they're using them as a hedge for some privacy. They don't um, prune those shrubs because they really want that as a privacy. The cranberry bloom, uh, the cranberry, American cranberry blooms just perfectly fine um, every spring, but the black haw has yet to bloom. And so the question is, what do, what, do why is it not blooming? Is it due to lack of maturity? Those sorts of questions are coming up. And so I would like to go ahead and share my screen because I'm going to be the one to answer this particular question. So let me pull this up for you all. So first of all, what I'd like to let you all know is that um, what I did with this is I'm taking this because I'm not familiar with these two, two uh, different types of plants. And so I was interested in researching them and finding this answer for you. So actually, this is called the American Cranberry Bush. This picture I took from the Missouri Botanical Gardens website. So it shows the actual flower of what it looks like, as well as the leaves and as well as the berries that you see. This is a, a plant that is native to Missouri. It's easily grown in average moist, well-drained soils. It likes full sun, but it can also go into part shade. It's used as a hedge, so it's being used appropriately for the purpose of, of the individual. If you decide you do want to prune this particular bush, if you decide you want it to put it in your yard, you would prune it immediately after flowering because the flowers in the spring are going to set on the growth of what's happening in the current year. And if you uh, prune it late in the fall, you won't have flowers then next year. It's a type of a, of a plant that you can put into your yard that's going to attract both birds and butterflies. And so we're all familiar with cranberries, but it's not the same thing as what they would have up in Massachusetts. And those fields are really interesting in Massachusetts and how they grow those in the bogs. Um, the next one is the black haw viburnum. 
Again, the pictures of, are from the Missouri Botanical Gardens website. And I thought this was a really pretty picture because it shows you the fruit that's hanging on it, as well as the bright red coloration that you're going to find in the fall. And we don't have a lot of red in the fall. We have some, but not a lot. So if you're looking to add red in the fall as coloration to your landscape, this might be a plant that you might want to consider. It too is native to Missouri. It also grows easily in average moist, well-drained soils. It can grow in full sun to part shade. It is a multi-stemmed bush, although you can cut some of those stems and make it into more or less a small tree. Again, it has that brilliant fall color and the birds are attracted to those fruits that are left hanging after all the leaves fall off. So why does, and here's what the picture looks like when it's in bloom in the spring. So why could it be, you know, the reasons as to why it might not be blooming as of yet? Uh, some of the, the information that I was able to find is that it usually takes more than just one plant to facilitate pollination. So if there's not a lot of blooms or hardly any blooms at all, it does need to have a second plant nearby for the cross pollination to actually occur. Another reason why is maybe there's too much shade. And so we need to think about that. Even though it likes full sun, it can go to part shade but not complete shade or a lot of shade. It will need some of the sun, just like all the other viburnums will need the sunlight in order to bloom. It could also be that there's much too much nitrogen fertilizer. Nitrogen actually helps to grow the green growth, the leaves of plants and some of the stems in order to get them to grow. And so if this is a plant that were in the yard, this one's in a raised bed, but if it were in a yard and you're fertilizing your lawn, perhaps there's too much nitrogen as to why that viburnum may not be. Also, viburnums do have to reach a certain type of maturity stage, and I am not sure what that maturity stage is for the black haw viburnum. Um, I do know from the question that it's been in the ground for about four years. The other thing to think about is that many of our native plants in general are monoecious, and what that means is, is that they have male flowers and they have female flowers, and they are self-incompatible. So that means that the male flower on that plant really isn't good at pollinating the female flower on that same plant. So you have to have some cross pollination and usually between at least two genetically different plants of the same species in order for a lot of fruit of any quantity to be set. So that what that means is, is that the plants are grown from seed. They're not propagated from uh, one plant where you would take a stem and do a stem cutting or try to root a stem off of the same plant and hopefully they can cross pollinate those will have the exact same genetics whereas two different seeds are going to have different genetics so that cross pollination can actually take place so there could be a couple of different reasons as to why it's not really blooming and these are just some of them that were listed out there when i did my research on this particular plant and i hope the answer helps you so let's go back and look at some of the other questions. Um, and Tamara, did you drop in the link on the Missouri Botanical Gardens plant finder? I sure did. Great. And so that's a, 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 a great um, place for you to research different kinds of plants that you're thinking about putting in your landscape. I go to that frequently to learn about different plants. It's really a great and it is scientifically based and we at Extension use that on an ongoing basis. Okay, so the next question that came in is um, a very interesting one. We see this one all the time, but it's always good to go back and refresh ourselves with what the answers are for this. So how do you raise summer as well as winter squash without insecticides, in particular with dealing with squash bugs? And so Justin, would you like to try to answer that question for us? Sure, happy to do so, Debbie. Um, so the squash bug is definitely... Are you seeing my screen there? Yes, but it's not in presentation mode. Yep. Gotcha. All right. So definitely a challenging uh, pestering pest to deal with um, when we're growing squash or the squash bugs. Um, there's a, a couple other insects in this pest complex that include the squash vine borer as well as the cucumber beetle. Um, but I'm going to give a little overview here of, of squash bug control and, and some non-insecticidal options. Uh, as well. 
So the squash bug is what we call a true bug. Um, it's in the order Hemiptera. Um, they're a little bit over half an inch long. They can vary in coloration um, from dark gray to more of a dark brown coloration. Their, their eggs are characteristically laid on the underside of the leaves. Um, and they do go through a number of different nymph stages, which we call instar stages. Um, these adults are capable of, of overwintering in our climates and they, they come out in the springtime, uh, they mate, and then they deposit their egg masses on the undersides of leaves. Um, in Missouri, research has shown we have at least two broods uh, per year of the squash bug. So you'll, you'll likely be dealing with you know, multiple generations of this bug throughout the growing season. So the crops most commonly affected are squash and pumpkin, but they can affect other cucurbit crops, um, just not, not as often. Bugs in this order, insects in this order, Hemiptera, they have needle-like mouth parts. Um, so stink bugs would be a, another one in this order. And so they insert those mouth parts into the leaves and they they suck the juices and the sap out of the leaves. And this can impact plants because it really affects the flow of sugars back down to the root system and um, other other nutrients and water movement and the plant can be arrested. And so when you have serious infestations, you can see plants wilting because of this situation. Uh, the larger the plants are, the more tolerant they are of feeding. So controlling them on, on young plants uh, is definitely important because they can have a, a pretty rapid impact on, on young plant health. They're pretty sneaky though. Um, if you've ever messed around in the garden with them, they seem to, to hide from you and, and move around the plant and keep an eye on you. They'll oftentimes be hiding under the leaves of the plants, which can make um, insecticide sprays uh, challenging to get good coverage. So with these insects, really early, early detection and action is critical. So, you know, and the small scale on the home garden, you know, you can remove these by hand, dump them in a, a pail of soapy water. Um, you can also use duct tape is really good at getting those nymphs. Oftentimes those nymphs will be congregated in a group. So it's easy to get a bunch of them at one time. You can also use that to remove the eggs or you can just squash the eggs under your fingernail. Um, it's important to note if you are trying to use any insecticide that it's really hard to control the adults with any of the homeowner insecticides. So targeting them early at the nymph stage is the best way if you are going to use any insecticides. I'm going to touch on non-insecticidal options here as we move on, but there are some synthetic options, permethrin, acetamipred, um, and there's also some organic options available um, if you are interested in organic options or you know, insecticides in general to control these. But it's important if you are using any sprays to get really good spray coverage um, on the foliage, on the underside of the leaves, upper side of the leaves, as well as at the base of the plant. There's some other options that folks might use. So they do like to hide um, in the evening time. So placing boards or newspaper in the garden can be one way to lure them to an area where they'll congregate. And then in the morning time, you can collect and destroy them. Um, you know, keeping excess plant debris out of the garden reduces areas that they can they can hide. And cleaning up at the end of the season can help reduce overwintering sites for these uh, for these insects. Although they are capable of moving out of the garden and overwintering in other places around the home landscape. This is a really great non-insecticidal option. Um, if you haven't used these before, these are floating row covers. Um, so this one here shows floating row covers that are placed over bent metal electrical metal conduit hoops. Um, you, you can also lay them directly on the plants. The squash plants are capable of supporting this fabric. If you're gonna use this for insect control, it's best to go with a lighter summer weight fabric. And that summer weight fabric will allow 90% light transmission. If you go to some of the heavier fabrics, they're going to reduce light transmission and they might cause heat accumulation underneath there, which isn't good in the summertime, but might be good in the fall time for season extension. It's important to have this on hand when you transplant the crops um, to prevent any of these squash bugs from getting onto the crop before it's deployed. So you want to secure the edges so it doesn't blow up in the wind. 
um, and that doesn't get any opportunities for other insects to fly or crawl underneath the row cover. The important thing to note about this though is these row covers, they really do need to be removed at flowering. Um, if they're not removed at flowering, you're not gonna get fruit set on your uh, squash or other cucurbits. There is another option though um, that is of interest to folks looking to avoid insecticide applications is what's known as trap cropping. And, and I had the fortunate opportunity to work with Dr. Jaime Pinheiro at Lincoln University, who did a lot of work on this topic. Trap cropping is basically a way of using a, a crop that's more attractive than the cash crop to pull insects away from the cash crop. So blue hubbard is the, is the trap crop that was studied in Missouri. It releases really high levels of a compound called cucurbitacin. And cucurbitacin is an olfactory compound that helps uh, insects identify the plants that they wanna eat. So this one basically pumps out tons of this cucurbitacin more so than our standard summer squash or pumpkins that we're growing. And it allows these insects to find the plant by releasing that compound. This has been proven to be effective for the whole pest complex of squash, which is squash bugs, cucumber beetles, and squash vine borer. And the way this works is you need to establish the blue hubbards sooner than you establish your cash crop. So you want these to be bigger, uh, more visible, and pumping out more of that cucurbitacin before the cash crop or your summer squash is planted in the ground. You can plant these at the row ends. So you could do uh, two plants per row end, but you could also plant these in pots if you wanted to. So for small gardens, that might be a lot more effective option um, just because of space concerns with the spreading of, of the Blue Hubbard, obviously. And you do need to, this isn't one where you kind of set it and forget it. You do need to monitor these Blue Hubbards um, because they do still need to be controlled. So um, although this, this is a great option for reducing and keeping insecticide application off of your cash crop, you might still need to apply an insecticide on these Blue Hubbard trap crops. Now you could potentially control insects by hand if you have a small garden, you just have one or two Blue Hubbard plants. Um, but what was recommended, um, if, you're, if you're looking for insecticide options for these, one thing that you could do is use a systemic insecticide. Um, a systemic insecticide has three to four weeks of activity within the plant and it will kill any insects that consume the plant. We all wanna do our best to protect pollinators. So with this kind of situation, you would wanna remove the blossoms from the trap crop so that those flowers aren't attractive to bees and cause any potential issues um, with the bees. If you're looking for organic insecticide options, um, I mentioned this one earlier, Azera, you can get a, a small container of this um, if you're interested. It's a combination of two kind of tried and true organic insecticide options. Um, it's a combination of pyrethrin, which is the chrysanthemum extract, and then azadiractin, which is uh, a type of neem extract. Um, other brand names for just the pyrethrins would be pyganic, uh, but this trap cropping system can be really effective. The floating row covers can be really effective. Um, if you wanna avoid insecticides altogether, the floating row cover is probably best, but in this trap crop system on a small scale, you might be able to manage these insects uh, on the trap crop by hand. But really good way to pull the insects away from the crop that you're looking to grow and pull them to a more attractive crop um, known in this system as trap cropping. So that's all I got, Debbie. Thank you, Justin, appreciate it. And just as a side note, when uh, Jaime Pinero was actually doing this research, I was um, working with a couple of the small scale farmers over here uh, doing the testing with the Blue Hubbard and those different things that you just explained here. And I'll tell you what, they worked. And I would go out every so many days to those locations and count uh, the, the live insects and count the dead insects. And I'll tell you what, the Blue Hubbard really does work as a trap crop. So great, great information. Greatly appreciate that, Justin. So thank you so much. Yep. Okay, so on to our next question. It's talking about rabbits. Um, it seems as if the rabbits have taken over the garden. Uh, they're jumping over the, the barrier that's there, the chicken wire, the hog panels, anything that they've tried to keep the rabbits out of their garden. Um, they've tried cayenne pepper and all of these things don't seem to work very well. 
Um, essentially, they're looking at their green bean crop and the rabbits have totally destroyed it. And they really want to get some green beans growing before the end of the season and looking for some ideas and some controls that might help them to take care of these rabbits. So, Tamara, you're really good at critter control. So why don't you tell us what you found out for us, please? Well, thank you. So rabbits are a little bit different than my six-legged friends that I'm normally talking about, but um, these these are adorable. Um, it's it's hard to believe that something so cute can be so destructive, but uh, rabbits can indeed cause damage throughout the year, not just when we're growing our gardens, but they're active year round. And so, so managing them, um, or keeping management techniques in mind throughout the year is, is important. So typically during the summer, they are eating that green veg vegetation, your, your vegetables um, and crops, um, but in the winter, they'll turn to trees or shrubs. So I am going to give some strategies for being able to um, manage rabbits um, throughout the year, but because the question is focused on um, in a garden, I'll, I'll spend more time on that. So of course, with all IPM, um, we need to first be able to identify the damage um, to be able to figure out what is causing it just in case um, it isn't rabbits, but um, being able to identify damage caused by rabbits is actually pretty easy. Uh, they're usually active during the day. Um, I see rabbits around my yard more often in the mor morning and in at dusk, but you, you can usually see um, where they are, that they're active, um, and see what it is that they're trying to eat. They also leave signs, so they'll, they'll leave droppings. They're about pea size. Um, they can leave tracks. Uh, it's pretty distinctive uh, for rabbit tracks. They also bite off young plants um, and small twigs in a very characteristic way. It's it's at a 45 degree angle. It's nice and clean, so you can you can tell that it, it was a rabbit. So these are typical rabbit management strategies. So physical barriers, repellents, scare tactics, uh, planting or not planting preferred plants, and hunting and trapping. Now, I'm going to say for the most part, those of us that are on this call um, or um, people who have a home garden, the physical barriers or exclusion methods are going to be what works the best. So that's our fences, cages, raised beds, and netting. Um, I'm going to mention some of these others uh, just so that you're aware of them as well. So like um, repellents, uh, that would be something that, that they don't appreciate the smell, and so they'll stay away. Uh, those can be effective, but they do have to be reapplied anytime it rains or um, if you're watering your plants and, and it gets wet. So just keep in mind if you do use repellents, it has to be applied frequently. There are also scare tactics. So sometimes people will put in uh, fake snakes um, or, or put owls around. Um, those work initially, but the rabbits are able to, to see that those are there. They're not moving. It's not actually doing anything and they eventually uh, just ignore them. Um, one scare tactic I've heard that does seem to be more effective is uh, have a motion censored uh, watering system sprinklers that would come on when they detect movement and that that can work the problem I see with that is uh, we also talk so much about watering in the morning so that your plants have time to dry so if you're having a, a motion detection sprinkler system come on at random times throughout the day you could actually be increasing your risk for diseases in your in your plants so um planting preferred plants um that's pretty self uh, evident you can see that to plant what they don't like plant protect what you, they do like um but in your garden they're going to like everything so and and we still want to have it so that we're not going to that's not going to work in the home garden so let's talk a little bit about physical barriers now this picture isn't great but i have it here to show um what what can be done um for for fencing and you can see that this is a uh, chicken wire it's actually two kinds of chicken wire. On the bottom, we have one inch, and then as it gets higher, it's it's two inches. But uh, something to learn from this is that uh, you want to have um, a vertical barrier that's at least 18 to 24 inches high so that they can't jump over it. And, and this is the part that a lot of people may not realize, is that it also needs to extend into the ground because they can burrow under the fence or they could slide under the fence. So you really want this vertical barrier to go above the ground and below the ground. And it needs to go at least six inches below the ground. If you don't have the ability to do it underground, um, then you can also lay it flat. So you'll also have a horizontal barrier 
and that needs to extend about eight to 12 inches. So if they come up to the fence and they think they can just uh, burrow underneath it, they're gonna get stopped by, um, by that mesh that's right there at the bottom. So make sure that you have it vertical and horizontal or else a ho a vertical that goes deep into the ground so they can't get past it. And one other thing to point out, because um, of the size that chicken wire is sold at, if you are putting it underground or, or maybe folding it down so it's L-shaped um, and you need it a little bit taller, when you put that second layer up here, make sure you tie them together, tie the two layers together so that it, it's not creating openings that animals can get through, specifically those very clever rabbits. So given that rabbits are not just um, active in the summer when our tender uh, vegetable gardens are, are there. They are also active in the winter. And so um, being aware of food sources that are available in the winter, we need to take care of them too. And so here are just some other options. Um, this goes very similarly to what I was talking about with, with fencing and exclusion, but we're doing it on an individual plant basis. So there are trunk guards um, to keep them from being able to gnaw on, on the bark. Um, and you can see that this is also done out here with these sensitive plants out here. Um, typically you're gonna use a wire mesh, um, but there also are some uh, polypropylene uh, meshes that you can use that, that can be effective as well. Uh, keeping in mind though, that rabbits actually can gnaw through plastic. Um, so, so metal is probably better. Another option is hunting or trapping. So rabbits actually are a game species here in Missouri. So hunting rabbits can be an option, but you have to be aware of what the local laws permit. Um, and, and also regarding the use of firearms during hunting season. So those of us who live within city limits, this probably is not an option to hunt rabbits, um, but it can be if you are not within the city limits and your local laws allow it. Trapping, on the other hand, is something that you can do, and you can always contact uh, MDC, the Missouri Department of Conservation, and they can help you with this. We also have a publication that is helpful. So uh, to properly cage rabbits, um, you can uh, you, you put, place the traps along rabbit runs or the trails. You're going to put in uh, fresh carrots, lettuce, apples, or clover, um, so that they would be attracted into the into the cage. Um, the cage does need to be big enough. It needs to be about seven inches. That that trap door needs to be about seven inches. And so this is one possible way. And again, you can always contact MBC to be able to help know how to do this. So there we go. Um, again, cottontail rabbits, they're adorable. And they can cause a lot of damage in our gardens, but rarely do they cause severe damage. There are steps that you can take to control these populations if they do become a nuisance. Um, and I have those listed right, right there. So um, give us a call if you need more information or contact your local MDC person. Thanks, Tamara. We had a question come in. How about having cats deter the rabbits? Yeah, so having animals that are in your yard, uh, that can deter them. Um, one thing I'd be very careful about with cats, yes, they can definitely keep a rabbit population down, but they also keep bird populations down. And so we do need to be very careful about having outdoor cats um, because they, they can affect other wildlife, not just the ones that we're targeting. And I'd also like to add, I don't have cats myself, but across the street, uh, they have two cats that are out considered outdoor cats. And um, I find them using my raised beds as a litter box quite frequently. So we need to be cautious about that when we're uh, working with our, especially vegetables in our garden or any fruit, anything that we're going to be eating. So make sure that you, you take that into consideration as well. So thanks, Tamara. Appreciate it. So our next question that, that came in to us had to do with sweet potatoes. So sweet potatoes aren't quite ready yet, I believe, to harvest. Uh, but what is the best type of harvesting piece of equipment, equipment, and I'm going to say the word fork, um, to use when harvesting sweet potatoes? And they wanted to see a picture of what uh, would be the best piece of equipment for that. And so, Justin, I'll let you go ahead and answer that for us, too. Justin, you're still muted. Sure. 
Sorry about that, Debbie. Um, so in terms of uh, sweet potatoes, a couple things to note. Um, they do have a long maturity window, um, but it is important to get them out of the ground before the last frost. At that time of the year, soils are, are moist and cool, and it can, um, can give you some situations with rot in the sweet potatoes, especially uh, fungal pathogens that might carry over after harvest and cause you some issues when you're storing them. So they're generally ready to dig when they're, the leaves are starting to turn uh, slightly yellow and it's best to remove the vines before harvest. And so you wanna do that about seven to 10 days prior. And when you do that, it's gonna help the skin of the sweet potato firm up so that when you harvest them, they're, they're not as delicate and you deal with less skinning. Um, in terms of storage, there is this period that if you can get a higher temperature and higher humidity, that will help the sweet potatoes, what we call cure. And so getting to that temperature and humidity will increase sugar content and it'll also help any um, cutting on the skins that happen during harvest heal over and they'll help them store uh, a lot longer. You don't wanna refrigerate them, um, best to store for long-term storage. Um, if you could get them in a cooler area, they're gonna store for for much longer amount of time. Um, but looking at harvest and harvest tools, um, what you really want to look for, the easiest way to do it is with uh, what's called a spading garden fork. And so unlike a pitchfork, it has much broader tines um, and a broader head. So it's going to be more capable of moving a larger amount of soil. Uh, the handle is generally sturdier um, and it's going to be easier to dig your sweet potatoes with this kind of fork than a pitchfork. Um, if you do have a larger planting, maybe a backyard planting or a planting at the community garden, you could use a broad fork, which is that picture on the far right. Um, that fork has a spread of, you know, from 24 to 36 inches. So it'll allow you to go down the row and loosen up that soil, uh, a larger amount of soil with one pass of that fork. So if you do have one of these forks, one, one trip or tick, pardon me, tick, <laughs> One trick is that you can place um, duct tape over the tines, um, especially the tine ends. And so if your tines run into a sweet potato, they're, they're a lot less likely to puncture it or do as much damage. So that can be one way to ensure a, a cleaner harvest. And when you're digging sweet potatoes, you want to start on the, the outside edge of the hill and kind of get that fork underneath there, get that soil moving and broken up. And then you want to start from the outside because it's easier to avoid puncturing the sweet potatoes. And then as you, you break up that soil, you'll start bringing those potatoes to the surface and you can place, place them in a, a harvest container to, to get them out. So with sweet potato harvest, just look for what's called a spading garden fork. It's, it's gonna have a broader head and broader tines and they're, they're not gonna be nearly as narrow and less likely to cause issues or, or puncture your sweet potatoes. Thank you, Justin. Appreciate that. Another question that came in for us is talking about um, a pull behind tiller, um, one that could work behind a riding lawnmower. Is there such a thing? Um, what are they where they, their garden is just really large? And as they, like me, getting older and having a hard time sometimes getting into the garden and actually doing some of that hard physical work, and they like to till their garden both in the spring and in the fall, but they're looking for a pull behind tiller um, to make that task a lot easier for them. And so, Eli, would you like to try to answer this question for us, please? Yep, sure thing. So I thought I would talk about the different type of tillers, how to get things done. Maybe talk a little about the pull behind tiller. Um, so, whoop, sorry about that. So the uh, types of tillers are hand tools, uh, walk behind tiller, you have front or rear time. The pull behind a lawn tractor, like this uh, person questioning was talking about, a three-point hitch mounted to your garden tractor. Um, so hand, tool, hand tools are very affordable and very accessible. You get them most anywhere. Require a bit of hard work, but you can get some very good results, uh, good to very good results out of them. Um, but they do take a fair amount of time to till your garden with. But you don't need much more than a, a digging fork, a shovel, and a, a garden rake. 
Um, and then there is a smaller options like a walk behind. You can have front tine or rear tine. I just found today an uh, electric Mantis, which is the really small tiller uh, for $140. Uh, if you've operated one, you know, they're pretty bouncy, and uh, but they're relatively effective, can't go very deep. You can get a front tine tiller um, for a little bit more money, which is a little bit of manhandling. Um, a rear tine tiller, like what, you, what is shown here, uh, pretty classic for a, you know, a very small market garden or a, a larger home garden. And some of the rear time tillers that can go up in price up to like $4,500, $5,000 for a, um, a, a walking tractor unit where you can put a bunch of different implements on it. <laughs> the nice thing about these rear time tillers is the tines actually counter rotate from the wheels. And so you get a very nice seed bed afterwards, nice till. Um, so some of the little ones like talked about that bounced around are the front time, um, pretty hard work. And uh, some of the other ones, the big ones, the walking tractor, it's pretty easy to use. So if you're gonna turn around at the end of the row, it might be a little bit of manhandling there. I mean, you get good and um, better results with those fillers. Um, what they were talking about specifically, sorry about that. What they were talking about specifically was this pull behind tiller. Um, it's a relatively expensive, you know, the cheaper ones, $1,400, a nicer one, $3,500. It's, I don't think it's something you can go down to your local hardware store or even your uh, uh, tractor supply company and uh, pick one up. You have to order it online. Seem to be pretty easy to operate. Uh, just has its own uh, power unit. You hook it up to the back of your ATV or your lawnmower or whatever you like. Um, <laughs> not necessarily as easy to back up in the tight corners because you're gonna have to, you know, it pivots. It's not mounted. Um, they seem to, from what I could tell today, from looking at them, you can have poor to good quality results. Um, a really nice one, the thirty-five hundred dollar one, get a little bit better results. But it's the kind of thing we have to go go pretty slow, and uh, but it will it will save your body some, for sure. And then uh, something that would really you know in the market garden size to larger you know or if you even have a, a big garden and you already have a um, garden tractor around would be getting a three point hitch mounted so you can pick it up and down easily with the tractor, take it wherever you like. Power supply, uh, the power takeoff on the tractor will run it. Um, something that's, you know, six foot and uh, will give you an excellent uh, seed bed, excellent tilt, uh, may run you up to $10,000 for a new one. <laughs> Relatively accessible, you can pick it up at tractor supply company or implement dealer. But um, yeah, a lot of them you want to buy used, so you got to seek that out. That's not too hard to hook up things to a three-point hitch, but it does require a bit more maintenance. You need to maintain the tiller and maintain your tractor. But with that tractor, you can get a whole lot of different amounts of work done, um, and you can get good to very good quality results. You know where it's a you know perfect to so super fine seeded crops. Um, to to answer the question, um, I think it's probably you know worth giving it a shot if you have a lot of tillage that you need to get done and you have some money you'd like to spend. Um, you said in the question, it's a little bit difficult for you to find help to till the garden. You know, even if you're spending a couple hundred dollars a year to get somebody to till your garden, it's going to take a few years before you break even on buying one of these. Um, but the great thing about having some power tillage gives you an opportunity to incorporate some amendments, incorporate your compost for the year, um, and get a lot of work done, you know, uh, without a lot of sweat. All right, Debbie, that's about what I got about uh, these pull behind lawn tillers. Thank you. Appreciate that. It's good to see that there's different options out there for different folks, depending upon what their needs are. Uh, we did have a question in the chat box that came in, and so we can op I'll open this up for all of us that are on here to answer the question. What are the thoughts on to till or not to till? Uh, I started when I moved back to Missouri a couple of years ago, I started my garden with um, uh, wood chips and I didn't till it all and I haven't tilled the garden. And uh, it's been three years now and the fertility is starting to get there. Um, it's okay. It's, it's a, I don't know if I'd recommend it to everybody. You know, having a nicely tilled garden that's dug really deep is pretty amazing as far as quality of vegetables. Tamara or Justin, do you have anything you'd like to add? Not a whole lot. That's pretty much, I, I, I tend to do very little tilling, um, but I have a small enough garden that I can get away with it. 
but, um, and I also have three sons that can help. So, um, so I think it, it's a, it's a per personal Sorry. preference. There are some environmental impacts uh, for tilling versus no tilling, but I think a lot of it's just personal preference. Yeah, and I've heard Donna, yes. and she's at a national conference. Um, I'm sorry, Justin, you go ahead first. No, uh, sorry, Debbie. Um, yeah, there are a lot of folks, look, you know, getting more interested in, in no-till vegetable gardening. Um, you know, anything that you can do to block the sunlight at the end of the season can be used to kill weeds. So a lot of folks on a bigger scale are using black silage tarps, um, but they're very capable of creating a, a clean seed bed and killing the established weeds that are in the garden. So there are a lot of great alternatives to um, weed control for tillage and to garden preparation um, that can help you avoid or minimize tillage. And um, Donna Oftenberg is really good about this topic, but she's at a national horticulture conference right now, so she's not on. But I know from hearing her often enough, what her comments would be is that you really don't want to till the garden both in the spring and in the fall. Um, when you do too much tillage of the same location over and over again, you create a soil pan. And essentially what you're doing is the top of that soil, however far down that tillage piece of equipment goes, that depth, all of that soil is going to be nice. And then there's that hard pan underneath where those times don't go and you create a barrier uh, between the, the soil from the top and the soil that's at below that soil pan. And you can have some, can get potential issues um, with your soil if you do till it too much. So a lot of different thoughts that are out there. And I am seeing a lot of folks going more towards the no-till as well. So what I'd like to do now is, um, I believe what we have up next is uh, we've got Tamara who's coming back again. She was on vacation for a number of weeks and had a nice respite, but she's going to talk to us about and do the quiz on friend or foe. So Tamara, take it over. Well, thank you. All right. So I'm going to share my screen. So hopefully you can see that. And I'm about to launch the poll. All right. Hopefully you can see the poll now. And so go ahead and tell me, is this a friend, a foe, neither, or it depends? I'll give you a few more seconds. All right, I'm gonna count down from five. Hurry and get your vote in. Four, three, two, one. All right, I'm ending the poll and I will share the results so you can see what your fellow Garden Hour colleagues watch or put their vote in for. And it looks like most of you said it depends. And then next was foe. Some of you said it was a friend and some of you said it was neither. Okay, so let me show you what I said it was. I said, this is a friend. And <laughs> I think there might be some people that disagree with me, but my big hint was I am actually holding that on my hand right there. And this is a, a, a beetle that I've actually gotten several questions in the last week, um, this morning and uh, just last week, somebody sent this in. And then I went outside and I found this beetle actually on my own deck. So um, it's it's out, obviously at this time it is, very large, intimidatingly large. It's over an inch in size, but it's not a pest. And let me let me explain a little bit more about this. So like I said, it is a large, large uh, insect. As a larvae, it actually can be about an inch and a quarter long. Um, it, it'll be a grub because it's a beetle and it's found in rotted old stumps and logs. And then this is just a video I made this morning um, but these adults can actually give an odor that smells a little bit like leather. Like I said, it's not a pest, um, even though it is found in trees, but it's only found in trees after the tree is dead and decaying. So the adults emerge in July and August. The adults are usually about one inch long. They're dark brown. They can have a mahogany brown coloration too. I'll just have that video go again. <laughs> they are typically flatter and more rounded in shape than a June beetle. Just so you know, they are very strongly attracted to lights at night. So if you're, if you do keep your lights on, you're going to possibly attract one of these to your house. I do typically recommend people do not leave their lights on because lots of insects are attracted and we can actually reduce a lot of our pests that we get in our house if we just don't have our lights on at night. 
So if you do happen to find this beetle in your in your yard, um, just just take some time to enjoy it. It's a really fascinating beetle. Um, some people have used them as pets. Um, I I just love finding little animals like this in my yard and, and feel honored that they came to visit me. So that is our friend or foe today. It is a friend this time. Thank you, Tamara. Greatly appreciate that. And so what I would like to do is to go ahead and um, do the horticulture terminology. So let me share my screen and get this started for you. So um, the term for today is gutation. And so is it water staying on a leaf surface due to curling of the leaf? Another name for wilting of the plant due to excess water? water droplets from the pores of some plants. And so if uh, Jared or Tamara can launch that poll for me so we can all um, have folks decide what they might, whoops, sorry about that, to, um, to do that. Um, can one of you do, there it goes, the horticulture terminology poll. Um, and if you wanna select what you think it actually is, that would be great. And like Tamara, I'm gonna count us down. So go ahead and, and pull in a guess. And if you're like, well, I really don't know, I don't wanna be wrong. Nobody's gonna know what you selected. This is totally anonymous. So, okay, so let's go ahead. I'm gonna end the poll and share the results. And so it's pretty even on whether the answer is B or C. A is definitely kind of not so much in the running. So let's find out what actually is Gutation. So gutation actually is the process of secretion of water droplets from the pores of some plants. Not all plants will actually do this, but a lot of the plants will. There is a farmer out there that I follow on Facebook. I've been helping her um, in my job is at helping her to be a better farmer. And uh, she actually posted this of her plants on her Facebook page. And I asked her if I could use this picture because I thought this was a great example. So you can actually see those water droplets on the edge of the leaves and you'll usually see them on the edge of the leaves that are there. So let's look at this just a little bit better. So we talk about gutation and we talk about transpiration and here is the difference between the two of them. So gutation occurs during night whereas transpiration occurs during the daytime. The gutation water loss is rich in minerals and if I believe correctly, I think potassium is one of those minerals. If it's transpiration, it's gonna transpire as pure water Water is lost as a liquid when it's gutation, and you can actually see those droplets as we did in that previous picture. Um, in transpiration, water is lost in the form of water vapor. Then with gutation, the process takes place through hydathodes. I hadn't come across that particular term, so I put the definition of what a hydathode is, and hydathodes are actually pores that exudes water on the surface our margin of a leaf of some plant. So that was totally new to me. So I thought that was interesting. If it's transpiration, the water vapor is actually gonna come out of the stomata. Um, and so a, a number of weeks ago, we talked about evapotranspiration as one of our horticulture terminology. And I said, the stomata will actually open to grab the carbon dioxide and then it will open again to release oxygen into the atmosphere. And so water vapor then moves in and out of the plant, predominantly out of the plant um, with transpiration. And then for gutation, it is an uncontrolled phenomenon. Whereas with transpiration, transpiration is controlled and a regulated phenomenon. Transpiration um, happens as part of the actual process of the plant's uh, life cycle and what it does on an everyday basis. Whereas gutation actually is something that doesn't happen all that often. There are a lot of different um, situations in where it could occur um, and they, it doesn't happen all the time. So I just thought that this was going to be a uh, pretty interesting because there's really two definitions, horticulture terminology, the gutation and hydrothodes uh, as part of, of today's example of the horticulture terminology. And so we've got just about three minutes left. And what I'd like to do is go ahead, Justin, were there any questions that came into the ask the questions here? Yeah, Debbie, there was one here uh, related to nasturtiums. 
uh, repelling squash bugs. So there's a lot of interest in companion planting. Um, I did find a number of anecdotal reports that nasturtium repels squash bugs, but I was unable to find any kind of scientific studies that um, investigated that phenomenon. Great, thank you. And so if that's all, then what I'd like to do is go ahead and send it back to Eli so we can go ahead and close out for today. Uh, thanks, Debbie. Um, I hope everybody enjoyed the garden hour. Um, here's a slide real quick to see how to uh, save the chat. I believe if you go down here to these three dots, you can click there and save the chat. Um, there's some good information in there, definitely some good links to follow back up on. Um, and you can always uh, revisit uh, past garden hours. Um, <laughs> excuse me, on our YouTube page, you can just type in MUIPM in the search box as you see it right here, and it'll pull up with uh, here's the, the horticulture town halls or the garden hours, however you like to think about them. And then plus a bunch of uh, great uh, science-based information coming from the extension and research staff. Uh, and uh, you know, we're still, we're still deep in the heart of summer. And so these garden hours are gonna keep happening. The next one is uh, next Wednesday, July 27th from noon to 1 p.m. If you have any questions, you'd like to have them answered during the garden hour, you can submit them here to uh, ipm.missouri.edu slash town halls, and you'll get to a page, you'll get to a submission box that looks just like this. You wanna click on the horticulture question one and then fill it in uh, with all the information and uh, then we'll be able to get to it during that next garden hour. And once again, here is a map of the counties of our state that we all live in and the city of St. Louis and the horticulturists that are covering the area. Feel free to take down their email address. If you got any questions, zip them an email. And uh, we really appreciate you guys all coming to this presentation today. Um, I want you guys to have a good week and happy gardening.